And joining us now live in our studio is our police chief, Hugh Stevenson. Good of you to come by. I know how busy you are. You are such a community-oriented person, though, already, and you're fairly new to the Sioux. Well, uh, I'm new, but I'm having an absolutely fantastic time meeting the people and dealing with the issues. And stuff. There's a new office, too, at the Station Mall. We do. We have a jump station uh, that we've put in place, and... Uh, our officers uh, from across the organization, depending on where they're working, but certainly the Zone 2 officers will be going there. They'll be completing their RMS occurrences, they'll be phoning witnesses, they'll be, uh, if they're on bike patrol, the bicycles will be moved in and out of the tip top, the old tip top location. Oh, okay. And uh, the motorcycle, the foot patrol, everything will be sort of stationed down in that area. And that's in relation to absolute community demand. They wanted to see us more often. Um, my feedback has been that they have been happy with what we've done so far, but there was certainly the need for greater visibility and access to the police. So will the facility on Gore still still be there? Absolutely. Okay. It services a different clientele, okay. obviously. It services people that are vulnerable. It provides them. So they're with, able to walk right in there. Absolutely, and that gives them eight hours of reprieve from the street. And it gives them the opportunity to have all the resources this community has. And it is led by the police, but the community partnership there is incredible. Mm -hmm. And it shows the commitment that it's not about punishing the user. It's about giving them support to get them out of that cycle of substance abuse. Well, poverty. in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I've never had an, an addiction problem. But for someone who is and who is in it, it would be so difficult for them to deal with the discrimination and, and you know, mm. the, the rough lifestyle. Yes, it, it captures them, and that's why they're in it. Mm -hmm. I don't think any human being would choose to live that life. And that's why we as a community, and long before I was here, had already instituted that role to give them the support. The jump office at the Station Mall has different objectives. It has increased visibility, it has increased access to the police, much greater relationship with the stakeholders and the owners of businesses there, and the mall management has been exceptional. And it increases the intelligence flow in that community. Um, we're there, we're approachable, tell us what's going on. Certainly, uh, you know, the theft from auto in that particular area, the drug distribution, the mm -hmm. prostitution. Mm -hmm. We're very clear. We want these people to understand this is our space and uh, we're not going to condone this behavior. And so it's, we're free as citizens to, to just come in without an appointment? Is that well, how that works? Well, it's not, a, it's not, it's not a quite like Gore. public accessible yet. No, okay. it's okay. still just for them to, and we're getting signs up right. so we know. Right. Uh, but we're taking in baby steps, mm -hmm. and uh, we're making sure that, okay, we're going to get situated there first. We'll see how that's working. And if the opportunity to open up a storefront exists, then we have to look at that in terms of where the report occurrence is. Is it going through the comm center, all those different Steve. things. Now sure. tell us about, you know, tomorrow's the big day. Mm. Everybody, every source of media is talking about pot. Uh -huh. So tell us how ready the Sault Ste. Marie Police Force is? Because it feels like there's not a lot of direction coming through media anyway. Well, uh, no, obviously we've known it's been coming for mm -hmm. quite some time. We've uh, researched uh, with uh, our CACP partners, our OACP partners, our colleague chiefs of police. And uh, so we are more than prepared. We have our policy in place uh, related to our own member usage or potential usage, as well as, uh, you know, our road safety and the purchase of draggers and 5,000s. And I uh, uh, no, we're more than prepared. I mean, really, at the end of the day, um, investigative-wise, uh, our members have always been trained up, ready to go. If there's drug impairment, we have a number of options to deal with, and we will. And uh, we'll put that evidence before the court with what's approved by the federal government in terms of testing and we'll move forward. Now tell us about policies um, and, and local police detachments. For instance, were you able to determine what your own policy would be here in Sault Ste. Marie? Well, yes, we, the senior management mm -hmm. team uh, and my deputy, we researched uh, what a variety of different agencies were doing. 
There's the fit for duty issue that basically you show up as a police officer ready for duty. So there's no issues as to your um, sleep, your nutrition, your uh, intoxicants, your obviously, fitness, your fitness, yeah. the whole issue to do the job. And I have absolutely no reservations that this service uh, is in, in no way not ready to do this. The, the rank and file police officers in this community are exceptional and I'm very proud to lead them. And as a result of that, we, we took the high road in policing and, and it's a really simple answer and that is we want to protect the public mm -hmm. and I want to protect the men and women and the civilians that work for us. And to do that, we need to set the bar high. The research we looked into Department of National Defense uh, Toronto Police took a position and we felt uh, Transport Canada took a position on pilots and the airlines have taken positions on pilots. Individuals that are in a high risk situation that are protecting the public. I want the public to understand that our frontline officers are fit for duty and to do that I set the bar at 28 days, no marijuana THC in your bloodstream. And we have the appropriate policies in place to deal with that. And uh, there is some variability across the country in terms of how different agencies have said it. To me, it's about public safety. Mm -hmm. And I leave it at that. So with regards to, uh, to the 28 days, so essentially you're telling or, or you're indicating that you will not have a police officer on your staff that smokes pot on a regular basis. You're correct. Right? Which is awesome. Because like you said, impaired is impaired. Now, that's stricter than the alcohol one. Because now, you know, the arguments are coming out now, of course, how pot and alcohol are completely different. Um, and f with your policy, they are as well. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason for that. Well, as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. the issue is, is that the research on THC and how long it stays in the body uh, we've been given numbers by agencies much larger than ours that it's a 28 day you're going to be clear. Why would I choose anything less than that mm -hmm. to say, well, maybe you're okay? At this point, the research indicates that's the safest for me as the chief of police to ensure that our folks are clear of that substance in their blood. You know, here's the issue. We become police officers to protect the public. And as my dear old mother said, just because it's legal doesn't mean you can do it. And so we've had alcohol for sure. hundreds of years. Sure. We know to be clear from alcohol, we haven't set, set times on it, but we know that our officers report for duty, they are clear of alcohol in their system. So I have to come back to that, that we choose a profession that's going to protect the public. Maybe there are costs in terms of you can't do what everybody else does. And just because it's allowable by law doesn't mean we will do it. And it certainly will mean that we will not put the public at risk in our role to protect this public. And I've said a lot of public stuff, but I'm also talking about our members. I want to make sure that that officer that goes to the call and that backup person, that civilian dispatcher, uh, the court officer person dealing with the situation, is clear and fit for duty. And well, to you know, do that, you, I set that standard. Yeah, and, and before we went here, you, were, you made such an, an awesome point that if, if a police officer, heaven forbid, has to draw his gun or, or takes sh a shot and injures someone, you, you need to know that that police officer was straight. Absolutely, all use of force options. Sure. From our voice, from our presence, to our baton, to our pepper spray, from our taser, to the firearm, to operating a police vehicle, to a pursuit situation. To for the potential suspect over. and for the officer. It's for the community and, and our, member, our members are part of that community. So I have no reservation whatsoever in terms of what we set, where we go. Will there be challenges? Probably so and, and we'll deal with that when it comes. But I know one thing, when I go to bed at night, I know my community, and my members are safe based on this policy. Have you had any reaction from, like internally, from, from your officers or your staff well, at all? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Every morning I go into the office, I go down to my frontline guys and gals and civilians and officers, mm -hmm. and I chew the fat. I have a discussion. 
I put it right out there. Sure. What, what do you think, guys and gals, right. with what I did? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they present lots of opinions, mm -hmm. and I say I'm open to listen. Right. But what do you think about my standard as a member of this community to say, no, Chief, we understand where you're going. Right? So that's awesome. And I felt that from them. I'm not saying I'm not open to critical opinion because mm -hmm. there's lots of arguments to say, well, what happens if, what happens if. And it's still so new. The hypothetical will, will always be there. But I know one thing, the policy of this organization and our ability to protect this community is solid. Now, for somebody watching who has been a regular um, cannabis smoker or is planning on becoming a medical marijuana user, for instance, I think there's a little bit of insecurity because things are different from community to community. Is there a suggestion that you would use, that you would suggest to them? I, I think it's important to um, be aware of local municipal bylaws, to be aware of provincial differences in the distribution for us 21 or 19 and the age of 21 in Quebec that mm -hmm. I've been reading. I think one has to be uh, self-schooled a little bit when you're going to change a jurisdiction whether it's municipal provincial or definitely federal in terms of your usage and uh, I know the media has been pushing that as well mm -hmm. you need to be self-informed even our own policy says uh, that you need to be aware of what other jurisdictions rules are in relation to use of this substance and you know what I think now um, travelers a lot of travelers are, are more educated. It, they Google the place, you know, mm -hmm. they do a lot more research. There's there's all these websites for, yeah. for hotel rooms and stuff. So it's easy to find out. Oh, if you're I'm going to Nova Scotia, find out what their mm -hmm. rules are. Well, you know enough to pack your clothing and where you're going to stay. You need to think about, if I am a marijuana user, then we need to know what the rules are in that location and, and then comply, obviously. Just one more question. Internationally, people traveling, because we're on an international border, of course, we understand that Michigan, it's still illegal. So it's obviously not a good thing to go across with any kind of cannabis on you. I would make sure that you check with the U.S. government, Homeland Security, before you as a user and or as involved in the industry are aware of what your rights and obligations are before you attend. Terrific. Thank yep. you so much for the information. I really Thank you. appreciate it. Have me back. Good to see you again. Thank you. We'll be back with more Top Story right after this.